Well, hey, welcome to Christmas Sunday here at First Church. We're glad you're here for week three of our Christmas series, Expect the Unexpected. If this is your first Sunday with us, we are one church that meets in more than one location. So we have family right now joining us from our Stone Canyon campus, as well as others who will join us later online. If you would, put your hands together. Welcome them into our time of study here today. Well, last Sunday in the sermon, I mentioned different Christmas traditions that families carry out this time of year, and there was one Christmas tradition I forgot to mention, and I heard about it as soon as the service was finished, and that was watching Christmas movies. How many of you guys enjoy watching Christmas movies this time of year? Okay, a whole bunch of you. Well, I want to see what some of your favorite Christmas movies are, so we're going to do a little voting. I'm going to put up a couple options up on the screen, and I want you to choose between the two options I give you. So when I point to one, I want you to hoop and holler. It's a little early on the slide. That's okay. You get to go ahead and think about it for a second. I want you to hoop and holler. I want you to shout out, clap, whistle, whatever you want to do for your favorite. Now, this first one, which you've already seen, it's a tough one. Two good movies right here, but let's see where our church is. How many guys, if you had to pick between one of these two, would pick the movie Home Alone? All right. Wow. Okay. How many guys would pick Elf? I don't know. That's about even. I would personally pick Home Alone. That's one of my favorite Christmas movies. We tried to watch it last year with my kids, and we can't watch it anymore because Alex had nightmares about people breaking into our house. So we're going to wait a few more years before we watch it with him again. But let's put a couple more options up here. Okay, Chevy Chase and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation or How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So let's see. How many Christmas Vacation fans do we have? Wow. You all have some Cousin Eddie's in your family, don't you? I can tell. All right. How about How the Grinch Stole Christmas? Not as many. My daughter, Addie, would definitely vote for the second one. She would vote for The Ginch, as she calls it. She wants to watch that movie over and over again, especially this time of year. Okay, here are a couple more options. Now, I have to admit, these are some classics. But I have never watched either of these all the way through. Like, I've seen bits and pieces of them, clips of them when they've been on TV, but I've never watched them all the way through. And some of you guys are shaking your heads in disbelief right now. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll get around to it. You guys don't work me so hard. I'll have some free time. But, no, I'm kidding. That's a joke. But let's see where you guys are in these classics. How many of you would vote for Miracle on 34th Street? Okay, good number. What about It's a Wonderful Life? A lot more. Okay, awesome. All right, here are a couple more to vote on. Okay, a Charlie Brown Christmas or Frosty the Snowman. Now, these are known for being children's movies, but really, we adults, we love them too, don't we? So let's see where we are. How about a Charlie Brown Christmas? Okay. And then what about Frosty the Snowman? Now, I like both these movies, but I would have to go with uh, Charlie Brown Christmas because that moment when they tell the real meaning of Christmas, Linus tells the story of Jesus' birth, that is just incredible. One of the best Christmas movie moments, I think, in my opinion. But I've got one more choice I want you to choose between. Here we go. How about Gremlins or Die Hard? Two awesome Christmas movies. Now, those are Christmas movies, right? Okay, yeah, people in the front row agree with me. Hey, they take place at a Christmas setting during Christmas time. They're Christmas movies, and they're both awesome. They're so awesome, we're not even going to vote because you can't pick between the two. We'll just move on from there. But thank you guys so much for participating in that. I can tell a lot of you, you're passionate about your Christmas movies. Somebody pointed out to me last year that many of our Christmas movies have a common theme. I hadn't really thought about this, but... There is a common theme that emerges in many of our Christmas movies. I'm not sure if you've noticed it, but it's this. Outsiders wanting to fit in. Outsiders wanting to belong. The excluded wanting to be included. Now, don't take my word for it. Here are a few examples. Take Buddy the Elf, for example. He's an elf living among humans, right? And he just wants to fit in, but he's very different. And you can tell he's different from everyone else he stands out in a world full of human beings what about this example Kevin from home alone now we love Kevin but Kevin feels like an outsider in his own family if you've watched the movie you know there's even one moment where he says my entire family hates me all of my family they don't like me and we know that's not true but that's how he feels he feels like an outsider here's a classic outsider Ebenezer Scrooge He lives in a town where everybody wants to celebrate Christmas, but not him. In fact, when people say Merry Christmas to him, what's his response? 
Bah humbug, right? He's the outsider. He's the outlier. He doesn't want to celebrate Christmas. Here's another classic example of an outsider. The Ginch, as Addie says, or the Grinch. He doesn't fit in with the people of Whoville. Now, when you watch the movie, you find out he wants to fit in, but he doesn't fit in. He's an outsider. And even that weird Christmassy Halloween movie that Disney put out a few years ago, The Nightmare Before Christmas, even in that movie, Jack Skellington, you know, the king of Pumpkin Town or Halloween Town or whatever, I think he's the Pumpkin King, that's his title, even he doesn't fit in in Halloween Town. He wants something more. Everybody else is satisfied. Everybody else is happy with the way things are, but not him. He's longing, searching for something more. There's this theme in many of our Christmas movies and stories of the excluded wanting to feel included, outsiders wanting to belong. And I think there's a reason for that because I think the idea, the concept of the excluded wanting to be included I think that goes back to the very first Christmas story, the original Christmas story, the Christmas story, the story of Jesus' birth. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app on your phone or tablet, go ahead and look with me, Luke chapter 2, that's where we're going to study today. If you have your first church app, you can follow along there as well. The scripture will be printed on the notes section of our first church app. But we're going to look today at what is known as the classic, the primary Christmas text in scripture, Luke chapter 2. And this is the passage where Jesus is born in Bethlehem and the angels announce his birth and shepherds come and visit him and Jesus is laid in a manger. This is the primary Christmas passage that we look at this time of year and we're going to look at it again today but before we do let me set the context here just a little bit Mary and Joseph they have had their lives turned upside down an angel appears to both of them and lets them know Mary's pregnant even though she's a virgin she's going to have a baby and this baby is going to be any baby this baby is God in flesh the son of God the long awaited Messiah the savior of the world and you are to give him the name Jesus. And so nine months pass and Mary is about ready to give birth to Jesus and the Roman government issues a census that everyone has to go to their town of family origin to be counted. So Mary and Joseph have to make the long trip to the sleepy little town called Bethlehem. And as soon as they arrive, it's time for Mary to give birth to Jesus. But there's no place for them to stay. All these people have come to Bethlehem because they have to be counted as well. And there's no room for Mary and Joseph by the time they arrive. But they find a spot to stay for the evening. They stay in a place where animals were kept. A barn, a stable of some sort. And Jesus is born. And the first place that the Son of God has to lay his head is in a feeding trough. A manger. It's probably not how we would have planned it out. Probably not how we would have wanted it to happen. But that's how it happened. No one expected it to happen that way. But that's how it happened. And as unexpected as all those circumstances were, what's even more unexpected is what happens next. The first people who hear of Jesus' birth, we probably would have never expected it would have been them. Read with me if you would Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 8. And the Bible says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So I want you to wrap your minds around this. I want you to understand what we just read. The very first people who were ever invited, by God, by the way, the very first people who were ever invited to come and see Jesus, experience his presence, possibly even hold him, were shepherds. Shepherds watching over their flocks at night. Now that may not be that big of a deal to us because we've probably heard or read this story before, but I think this is the part of the story that over the 2,000 year history of the church has been lost in translation. Because when I was growing up and I would hear this story, either my parents would read it to me or hear about it in church or I would see a Christmas play, when I would picture the shepherds, what came to my mind were these 
older gentlemen who were wise and gentle, taking care of these sheep, probably had long beards and staffs, and there were these quiet men who were good leaders of their sheep. That's the image that came to my mind. But that's not exactly who shepherds were in this day and age. That's not the reputation they had. Shepherds, they were known for being outsiders. They were a little rough around the edges. They were social outcasts. Shepherding wasn't an occupation you set out to become. Shepherding was an occupation you settled for. No one wanted to be a shepherd. And here's why. First of all, shepherding wasn't just a job. Shepherding was a lifestyle. Did you notice what verse 8 says, said in this passage that we just read? It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. What are these shepherds doing? They're not just working in the fields. They're living out in the fields. Shepherds spent the majority of their time living in the fields with their sheep. This is how the average routine of a shepherd would go. You would spend weeks and weeks at a time with your sheep watching over them, and then you would get a few days off to go back to the town where you were from, maybe spend with your friends or family, and then guess what? After a few days of being back home, you went back out to the fields again to take care of your sheep. Shepherds spent all of their time with their sheep, and so you know what that meant? They smelled like sheep. They were dirty. They were nasty. They were social outcasts. Shepherds were also known for getting drunk while they were out in the fields. And they would come back in to the towns where they were from and they would tell all these great stories about the things that they had seen while they were out watching their sheep. These tall tales, these embellished, exaggerated stories. And once a shepherd started telling one of his stories, everybody just kind of rolled their eyes like, there they go again. Nobody believed them. It's kind of like how people today tell fish stories. You know what I'm talking about? My son Alex, I love to take him fishing, but if you ever ask him after we finish fishing how big was the biggest fish he caught, you need to like subtract it you know, by half or so because it's always bigger when he describes it than the fish he actually caught. You need to like cut it in half. And you guys know people like that. The more they tell a story, the more they embellish it, the more they exaggerate. And that, those were the shepherds. They would come back and tell these big tall tales and they thought that their stories were great, but everybody in town just kind of rolled their eyes. There they go again. They were so untrustworthy that shepherds were not allowed to testify in a public court of law. Their testimony just wasn't trustworthy. They were complete social outcasts. They probably didn't have a lot of friends because if they spent weeks at a time out in the fields, the only people they ever really hung around with were fellow shepherds. And if they had families, they probably was, it probably wasn't the best family situation because, again, they would just come in for a few days at a time and see their wife and kids and go back out again. They just really didn't fit in, didn't live the normal life that everyone else lived. But not only were they social outcasts, they were religious outcasts. Remember, shepherds were dirty. They took care of dirty sheep. And sheep have babies, and they would deliver those babies. And also sheep die, and so they would handle the dead bodies of sheep. And because of that, they were not allowed to worship in the temple because they were considered ceremonially unclean. Social outcasts, religious outcasts. Shepherds were known for being dirty, unsophisticated, rowdy people. Most of the time, they were just misfits who couldn't make a living doing anything else. Shepherding was one of the most dreaded occupations in the first century world. And yet, the first invitation that God ever sends out for someone to come and see and hold his son was sent to shepherds. I mean, think about that. The first people besides Mary and Joseph to see Jesus, the first people to come in contact with him, the first people to look at him in the eyes, the first people to hold him was a group of roughneck shepherds. Why? 
I mean, let's be transparent. We probably would have planned it out totally different. I mean, if we were planning out Jesus' arrival, we probably would have made sure that dignitaries and celebrities and the social elite, that they were all there. We would have made sure the media was there to cover it. We would have scheduled parades in the streets and parties for Jesus. That's what we would have done. But God did none of that. And I think there's a reason for that. Because I think this is a very real powerful, vivid picture of why Jesus came. This is a very real and powerful picture of Jesus' mission. Because Jesus came to save, to rescue, to restore, to include all people, even shepherds watching their fields at night. Do you notice the words of the angel? When the angel announced the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Not just for some people, not just for certain people, not just for a select group or for the elite, not just for the rich and famous, not just for the religious leaders, for all the people. Jesus came for everyone. You know why? Because everyone matters to him. Everyone. No matter your social class, no matter your economic background, no matter your racial background, no matter your cultural background, it doesn't matter. You matter to him. You are worth everything to him. He came for you. And so I don't know where you are today. I don't know what type of year you've had. I don't know what type of quarter you've had or month you've had or week you've had. I don't know what pain you're carrying today. I don't know what past you've had. I don't know who's hurt you or maybe who you've hurt. But I do know one thing. Jesus came for everyone and that includes you. No matter where you are right now, that includes you. The good news of Jesus is for all people. Hurt people and broken people, forgotten people and isolated people, marginalized and abused people, flawed people, people who've messed up their lives, people who everyone else considers to be misfits. He came for everyone, including you and me. And God wants all of us to know that we are loved by him and we have a place at his table. I remember when I grew up, there was a local grocery chain that had a commercial that they would show every year around Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it was of this little boy who was at his grandma's house for what looked like to be Christmas dinner. And so everybody's getting everything ready for the meal. And this little boy, he's nervous. You can just tell in the commercial he's nervous. But he walks up to his grandma, and you can see in the background two tables. There's this big table where obviously the adults sit, and then a little table, which was the kids' table. Anybody growing up to family meals where there's always a kids' table? I did, and I always said, the, I still said the kids' table, by the way. But there was a kids' table, and there was an adult table. And this little boy walks up to his grandma, who's big. He getting all the preparations made and he looks at his grandma and he says grandma I've gotten bigger do you think this is the year that I could sit at the big table and his grandma in the commercial got all teary-eyed and looked at him and said yeah I think this is the year I remember watching that commercial as a little kid and I thought you know I've gotten bigger it's time for me to sit at the big table So that year, we got together with all of my mom's family, and we went to see my grandparents, and my grandma was busy getting all the preparations for the Christmas meal made, and I thought, here's my chance. And I walked up to my grandma, and I looked at her right in the eye, had this little speech prepared, I said, you know, grandma, I've gotten bigger, and do you think this is the year that I could sit at the big table? And she looked back at me, and she goes, nope, we just don't have enough room for you there. You've got to sit at the kids' table. I'm like, what? That's not how it's supposed to happen. I was so upset, so disappointed. That commercial lied to me. It's not how it's supposed to happen. And so I had to go sit at the kids' table and just stare at everybody at the adult table, you know, like, man, I wish I was over there. We've all had moments in our lives when we have felt excluded. And a lot of times those moments have been a lot more serious 
than sitting at the kids' table at grandma's house. Maybe you have felt excluded because of past choices that you've made. Maybe you have felt excluded because of the pain that someone has caused you. Maybe you felt excluded because of unfair judgments that other people have placed on you. Maybe you have felt excluded because of a lack of success, or at least a perceived lack of success in the eyes of others, maybe a lack of popularity. Maybe you have felt excluded just because of your choice to rebel against God's will for your life. No matter how you feel right now, no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, Jesus came for you. And the Bible reveals that including the excluded is central to the mission of Jesus. Later on, Jesus will teach the crowds and listen to what he says in Luke chapter 19. Jesus says, for the Son of Man, speaking of himself, came to seek and to save those who are lost. I want you to pay careful attention to that. Jesus didn't wait for us to come to him because he knew even if we ever figured out that we needed him, we didn't have the ability to get to him. Jesus came for us. He came seeking us because he loved us. And he knew that we needed him and he didn't want us to stay in the spot that we were in. We matter to him. And I know that that may be hard for some of you guys to believe that there is a seat for you around God's table, that you matter to the creator of this universe, that he has a purpose and a plan for your life. I know that may be hard for some of you guys to believe and I bet it was also hard for the shepherds to believe. And that's why I think the angel, the angel specifically says what he says. If you jump back into Luke chapter 2, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. He's already stated Jesus for everybody. But look at what he goes on to specifically say. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. You get what the angel's doing here? Hey, Jesus has come for everybody. And he's not looking past you. That includes you. See, sometimes when we hear Christmas messages like that, that Jesus came for all people, we say, yeah, that's great. Everybody but me. And I think what the angel wanted these shepherds to know in Luke chapter 2 is what he wants everybody listening to this message today to know as well. Jesus came for everyone, even you. He's not looking past you. He came specifically for you. And you may be saying, but Chad, you don't know how messed up my life is. You don't know the wrong things I've done. You don't know the darkness that I've lived in. I just want to let you know something. You are among a group of people who have lived in darkness. You are sitting among a group of people who've messed up their lives. You're sitting a bunch of, around a bunch of misfits, honestly, if you want to know the truth about it. And yet now, we're living in the light of Christ. Now, we have a relationship with God that we don't deserve. Now, we have a hope that we don't deserve. We have a peace that we don't deserve. We have a life that we don't deserve in Him. And that's the whole reason why Jesus came, to give us a gift we don't deserve. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 3. Paul writes, for all have sinned, everybody, you, me, everybody, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus came to give all of us a gift that we didn't deserve because none of us could find God on our own. We needed him to give it to us. We needed him to give us that relationship, that access to God, and he did so by going to the cross, giving us a gift we didn't deserve. I did my undergraduate work at Johnson Bible College just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, and every single year they would have this Christmas, ba this Christmas banquet for the students, and only the students were invited. You could bring a guest if you were married or engaged, but if you weren't married or engaged, you couldn't bring a guest. You just had to hang out with friends or ask somebody else on campus to be your date for the night. Only students were allowed to go, and so every single year I would go to this Christmas banquet, and it was awesome. I mean, they have the best food in the world. They would always serve us 
red velvet cake. And I don't know what, how they fixed their red velvet cake, but it was phenomenal. Best red velvet cake I've ever had in my life. And there was always some entertainment program or something. And it was a formal night. All the students would get dressed up and just a lot of fun. And we always looked forward to it every single year. But I couldn't wait for the day when Alice and I were engaged so that I could bring her with me. Because for three years we dated, but she went to a different college than me, and so I had to go by myself. And so every year I would hang out with friends, but I knew that one day we'd get engaged, and then she could come with me to this Christmas banquet. And so sure enough, our senior year, we got engaged prior to the banquet. I signed up for the banquet, signed her up as well. She went out and got a new dress, because again, it was a formal thing, and she was all excited to come and be there with me. I was excited for to be there and the day of the Christmas banquet I got a phone call and it was from the office of the Dean of Students and they said uh, Chad we see you're signed up and beside you there's this Allison Runyons who is that I said oh well that's my fiance they said oh no no you can't bring outside guests I said no no I know that but we just got engaged so now she's allowed to come with me and they were just like oh you didn't hear we changed that rule you can only bring a guest if you're married but you can't bring your fiance anymore it changed this year. And I was like, what? And they said, yeah. So I went to the office of the dean of students, talked to him. He was a good friend of mine. And I talked to him. And he said, Chad, I just can't bend the rules for you because I've already told no to a bunch of other people. And I said, but she's on her way. Like, she's on the road because she lived three hours away. She's on her way now. He said, I'll tell you what. She can come and she can sit at your table, but she just can't eat the meal. And I was just like... Well, she's going to go hungry then. No, I didn't say that. No, I said, well, can we share a meal? He said, that's fine. Just one plate. You guys can share a meal. And I was thinking, well, if we're, you know, still hungry, we're going to McDonald's afterwards, whatever, you know. So she came, and she sat at our table, and they started bringing around the plates of food, and they, bought, and they brought around a plate for everybody, even Allison, me and Allison both. And I didn't say anything because I thought they didn't ask, and they just brought a plate to everybody at the table. I didn't say anything. I got a plate. She got a plate. We started to eat. And as we were eating, there was a tap on my shoulder, and it was the dean of students. He said, Mr. Broadus, can we talk for a second? And I walked away from the table. He said, I thought our deal was Allison could come, but she wouldn't eat. And I said, yeah, that was our deal. And I said, I'm sorry, it's my fault. They brought the plate around. I didn't say anything. I just let it happen. He said, it's my fault. I took ownership of it. He said, wait right there. And he walked away. And he was gone for it seemed like an eternity. <laughs> But eventually he came back and he was holding a plate with a piece of red velvet cake on it. And he said, listen, because of all the busyness of tonight, I haven't had my meal yet. If anybody asked, Allison ate my plate of food. And here's my piece of red velvet cake for her. And I looked at him and I said, Dean Leg, you don't have to do that. It's my bad. I'm sorry. And he said, it's okay. I love you, Chad, and I want you to have a good time with Allison tonight. See, that's the definition of grace. Mercy is just not getting in trouble. It would have been great if he would have said, okay, I'll let this pass. But for him to give me an extra piece of cake, his piece of cake, it's a gift that I didn't deserve. That's what grace is. Grace is being rewarded even when you don't deserve it. See, every time I see a Christmas gift... That's what I think of, that Jesus came to give me a gift, a prize, a reward, whatever you want to call it, that I didn't deserve and I couldn't earn. And honestly, I think we got this whole Christmas gift thing backwards. Because we teach people that gifts are for good little boys and good little girls. And if they're good enough, then they get their gifts. And really what Jesus came to do was to give a gift to those who didn't deserve it like you and like me every time I look at a Christmas gift I'm just reminded I've been given the greatest gift of all life in Jesus that I don't deserve and I hope you see the same thing and when you realize what Jesus has given you What's your response? Well, look at how the shepherds responded in Luke chapter 2. When you read on, it says, So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. How did the shepherds respond? 
they told everyone about what they had just experienced. Now remember, shepherds didn't have the best reputation. They were known for telling tall tales and exaggerated stories. No one believed them. Their testimony wasn't even accepted in a court of law. And they knew that there would be some people who wouldn't believe their testimony, who wouldn't believe this story of this king who was born in Bethlehem. And yet they didn't care. They told everyone. You know why? Because the good news of Jesus was too good to keep to themselves. They had to tell everyone they saw. And here's the thing. People actually believed them. If you jump on down to verses 16 through 18, the text says in Luke chapter 2 in verses 16 and 18, if you want to move on to the next slide, it says they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They were, they were amazed at their testimony. They believed them. Why? What was different this time around? Apparently, this story they were telling was different. Because these shepherds had been changed. Their lives had been transformed by encountering this king who had been born. And they didn't just believe the story they were telling. They were living it out. And people saw something different in them. And honestly, I think the same should be true for us today. The good news of Jesus, well, it isn't just something we believe. It's something we live. It's something we live out. And guys, as a church today, we get the opportunity to do just that. Last year, we decided to do something different as a church for Christmas. Instead of just coming together for services around the Christmas time, we want to go out and be the church and show people the love of Jesus. And so we met together last year on Christmas Eve and took meals out to families in need throughout the Owasso area. And we had a tremendous turnout. It was a life-changing day if you were a part of it. So we decided to do that again this year. And this year, we doubled the family names that we're taking meals to. And you guys have responded. You guys have signed up to take those meals today as soon as services are done. And we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for doing that. Because there are families right now in the Owasso area who feel like outsiders, who feel excluded. And we're here to let them know that they matter to God, that Jesus loves them and he came for them. And you just never know by taking a simple meal to somebody around the Christmas season what God can do with that, what type of impact you can make. Here's one of the stories we heard from last year. Take a look. I'm Steve Peters. This is my wife, Christy. Um, we've been going to First Church for about 12 years. Well, last year about this time, we, uh, we were looking to get involved with the Christmas serve day and through the, uh, through the meal. And uh, we had known this family that Christy had uh, kind of got acquainted with through her school. Yeah, we just, um, I became aware of some students at our school that uh, need a little bit of extra help. And it was a single mom and her two boys, ages 3 and 12. So myself and about two other families went to their apartment. And um, I just um, explained to her the best I could um, through uh, her son, who translated for her, uh, why we were there and that we just wanted to love on them and bring them some food and uh, just be a blessing to them. We prayed for her and then she hugged us and just talked a little bit and shared some things and then parted ways. It it really wasn't a real long visit. Christy was so moved after that that, that, uh, and I didn't have the opportunity to be involved in that delivery of the meal. So she said, we've got to go back over there and and visit with them. And so, you know, we didn't want it to, to end at that point. You know, we felt really led to to uh, take this further. Uh, And I had asked her, you know, what was her greatest need? You know, how could we help her? And she said, you know, that she worked a lot and uh, childcare would be very helpful to her. And so we just kind of thought about it for a minute and just said, well, I, I don't see, you know, we all lead busy lives, but I think one night a week I could help you out and keep the boys for you. So um, I go there every Wednesday night, pick up the boys, and then keep them while she works her night job. 
and then uh, take them home. These boys, you know, they, they were uh, without a father. You know, they, they didn't have a father. They, here, uh, this mother was just working two jobs to try to get by. And I thought, you know, we can step in and fill some gaps. We can help out. So this has been going on for about a year now, keeping the boys and involving them more and more in activities, you know, having them over for Thanksgiving and uh, going to look at Christmas lights and together and just kind of doing some things together. And she's been really appreciative of that. God has definitely worked in our, in our life this year. Sometimes we get to where we're kind of in our own box. We get busy, things happen, we have our own family, we have our own jobs and so forth, and sometimes you get so busy that you don't just slow down to, to really look around you. Uh, just taking that step, that step of faith out there to, that we're just gonna jump in and do, you know, God show us where we can be most helpful. Sometimes it's just a simple word or, or just helping someone out of a difficult situation. Uh, but just just kind of, op it opened my eyes to the needs around us and how those are so great. Jesus wasn't born just to start a holiday. He came to revolutionize this world with the love of his Father. And today we get to be part of that revolution. We get to be part of his mission. We have a love to extend. We have a light to shine. We have a hope to share. We have good news to spread. And so if you signed up to take one of those meals today, again, thank you. We don't know if what happened to the Peters is going to happen to you. You may not have the results that you're expecting or hoping to have, but you just have no idea how God might use your encounter with a family this afternoon. If you haven't signed up for a meal, I've got word that we have some extra meals. If you want to take one, we need some people to take them. So at the end of the service, you'll hear more about that. And even if you don't have time to take a meal between our time frame this afternoon, we ask you guys to bring in a bunch of extra pies, baked pies today. Because even if you didn't take a meal or sign up for a meal, and even if you did, take a pie with you and take it to someone you know. We don't have names for those pies. Take it to a neighbor, take it to a coworker, somebody who needs to know that they matter to Jesus. We have a chance today to unleash a revolution of God's love in an incredible way. Let's go out and love like Jesus. Because we're here to let everyone know they're invited to the celebration of Jesus' birth because everyone matters to him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today and this chance we've had to open up your word and be reminded of the fact that you came for everyone, from the least to the greatest. We all have a place around your table. We all have a place in your plan. You have a purpose for our lives. And we pray that we will not just receive that good news ourselves today and live that good news out, but that we will also share it with others so that others can experience your grace, the wonderful gift of your love, living in relationship with you. It's in the name of Jesus that I lift up this church as we go out and unleash a revolution of your love today. Amen.